The worst thing, said Billy, was lowering the flag. Billy is the young American soldier we have been following since his first days in Vietnam, with the help of footage taken by the Army's cameraman. This series could have been called the Ballad of Billy Brown, the ballad of the two and a half million Billy Browns who came here to fight in a war they couldn't understand. At first, it was a French war, lost at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Then it became an American war, aimed at preventing communist North Vietnam from conquering the South. A war of big operations. A war of napalm and tunnels. Of endless suffering. War as the disease of humanity. And this war was particularly terrible. These eyewitness reports by US Army cameramen were shut away in film libraries, like something they hoped to forget. Today, over 20 years after the end of the conflict, the openness of American institutions allows us to see the war as it really was. Spring 1968, they have won the Battle of Tet. With negotiations underway, there is hope again. Passing under San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, there's still children heading for Saigon. In the 1968 presidential election, Richard Nixon defeated the Democrat Hubert Humphrey, in whom the hopes of so many young people had been placed. Nixon was a harder man. There was no question of his letting go of South Vietnam. But it was Tricky Dicky who developed the Nixon Doctrine, a gradual withdrawal of American troops from Vietnam. But it would take some negotiation, and the North Vietnamese were not yet ready. These GIs don't realize the war will begin again, and in 1969, the American army will reach its maximum strength, 543,000 men. Good morning, Vietnam, rang out each day from the speakers of the Armed Forces Radio. Good morning to the unreal world of Saigon. For every soldier who would get killed, wounded, mutilated or shell-shocked for the rest of his life, hundreds of others were hidden away in offices, just as in every other war. The only danger they were likely to face was venereal disease.
in a strange country now, with strange and lovely girls, and some even stranger diseases. Venereal diseases, for example. Now, you can pick them up easily out here. It doesn't take long, and there are five different kinds. Sober enough to remember to use a prophylactic, carry them with you, and be sure to use them. All right, gentlemen, I'll see you in the shot line. The old hands knew that it was better to take leave in Thailand, where prostitution was regulated. But that was only a passing temptation. Back at the front, soldiers like Billy had only the letters from their fiancés and the hope that they'd stay faithful. They worried about Jody, their name for the seducers roaming their hometowns back in the world. As the song put it, ain't no use in going home. Jody's got your girl and gone. There were other answers, going it alone, for example, or an affair with one of these women, seen here enlisting in their own army. Most of these young women were honourable and strong and beautiful on both sides of the conflict. In the South, brief encounters with Americans led to the birth of 15,000 children with uncertain futures. But the dream was to marry a nurse. Just like a character from a Hollywood story. Of course, she wanted to marry. Preferably an officer. An officer and a gentleman. Nothing has changed in Vietnam. The food is just as bad, and there are still as many blacks. Such thoughts were common among Southerners, as the black struggle for integration and civil rights rocked their states back home. Nineteen sixty eight was the year of the Black Panthers, of black ghettos in flames, and the assassination of Martin Luther King, who had opposed the war. The neighbors soak in the heat radiating from the engine, revel in the dry blast of the exhaust, taste the dry grass in your mouth as you bask in all the edging, trimming and weaving. Oh, summer was made for this. This man do, we bring them here for processing. Black troops saw themselves bitterly as American cannon fodder. There were fewer blacks in the more prestigious Air Force and Navy than in the infantry where blacks made up as much as a third of the personnel, though they accounted for only one-tenth of the American population. The American command tried to reduce this proportion, but in 1969, African Americans still suffered 30% more casualties. Being less educated, they didn't get desk jobs behind the lines. They were in the combat units. They were the most exposed. Hispanic Americans were another exposed minority. Perhaps that is why they always attended services. In fact, everyone went to church. When the chaplain landed in your sector, it was an opportunity to pray to God for protection from the hard times ahead. On May the 10th, 1969, the famous 101st Airborne Division attacked North Vietnamese positions on the Laotian border near the mountain of Dong Ap Bia. It was called Hill 937, known in American military history as Hamburger Hill, where men were made into mincemeat.
We've never seen so many people wounded in such a short time, complained the staff of the Mobile Army Surgery Hospital, or MASH. is suffering. An army surgeon attempts an emergency tracheotomy on a seriously wounded soldier in a hopeless attempt to save his life. During the ten days of fighting on Hamburger Hill, Bodies of GIs poured into the army morgue. For the mortuary attendants, collecting dog tags was just routine. Senator Edward Kennedy, expressing the general frustration, couldn't find words harsh enough. Hamburger Hill has been a senseless and irresponsible operation, he said. In any case, it would be the last major battle between American ground forces and the enemy. After that, Nixon spoke only of Vietnamization. Vietnamization meant the eventual withdrawal of American troops and the South Vietnamese taking over their own defense. We should embark on this process with care, warned the CIA. Its bureau chief for Southeast Asia and future director, William Colby, was nominated significantly as assistant to the commander of the American forces. In Colby's view, the Viet Cong infrastructure had to be destroyed before any troop withdrawal. The Tet Battle and the battle for the borders had put most of the North Vietnamese military force out of action. It was now necessary to purge the South of its guerrillas. Operation Phoenix would destroy all underground resistance, but with a brutality that Congress condemned. The Senate Select Committee inquired about many accusations of torture and assassination. Colby himself admitted to 20,000 dead. But it was in combat situations, he declared. And Colby added, 30,000 Viet Cong have been captured, and more than 20,000 have turned themselves in, thanks to a general amnesty. 90% of the population of South Vietnam now lives in security. But Congress and public opinion were increasingly hostile. To add to this tension, there was the discovery of the massacre at My Lai, committed a year earlier. The military inquiry 
sent a commissioner to the village to establish the facts, until then concealed by the military. A platoon of the 1st Battalion of the 11th Infantry Brigade, commanded by the young Lieutenant William Kelly, had arrived here after an exhausting search for an elusive enemy. It was the familiar awful story. Mines and booby traps had killed or wounded many of the GIs. The survivors, strung out, massacred the inhabitants of this village. 400 dead, women, children, the elderly. It is one of the most shameful incidents of the war and the best known. Kelly was sentenced to life. 200 other army personnel and 77 Marines were also brought to trial. But for public opinion in America, atrocities like this should never have happened. It was not the American way. It was no excuse that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese had done the same or worse. Because at the same time, the South Vietnamese had discovered a horrific mass grave ten times larger than the one at My Lai. Thousands of people murdered at Hue during the short period the communists controlled the city in February 1968. The Viet Cong assassinates the Vietnamese people, proclaimed the banners. More than ever, the whole war had become unforgivable. Here in the Mekong Delta, Special Forces hovercraft set off on a hunt to the death. The jungle had been defoliated and the tunnels gassed. Now the Viet Cong fighters would be denied refuge in the rice paddies. Viet Cong films show how they continued against all odds to use the Mekong as an extension of the Ho Chi Minh Trail to distribute supplies and ammunition right into the heart of South Vietnam. The Americans had to provide indefinite support for their patrol boats along the Mekong. These small units of the Brown Water Navy, the less glamorous sister of the Blue Water Navy.
Everything was suspicious. Everything was dangerous. A sampan full of women, a child at the edge of the mangrove, could lure them into an ambush. They had to check dozens of sampans every day. Hours and hours on the river, days, years. This is how the Vietnam War dragged on. Senseless. That was the verdict they all wrote home. From one monsoon to the next, Vietnam was like a boat sinking in the mud. To raise morale, John Wayne was sent in. He was at the end of his career. He had cancer, but was prepared to sacrifice his remaining strength to help support the troops in Vietnam. He had just dedicated a film to them, The Green Berets, which he directed. For him and for other American stars such as Charlton Heston, American involvement in Vietnam was legitimate. It was a matter of political orientation. On the left, Jane Fonda had offered her support to Hanoi. Billy now knows how to look after himself. From time to time, he borrows a jeep and goes off on R&R &R at China Beach near Da Nang a holiday club just a few hundred metres from the Viet Cong. Anchored offshore is a German Red Cross hospital ship on a humanitarian mission. It's just the opportunity for some flirting between GIs and nurses. One day, one of them will be careless. On a picnic outside the base, she'll be captured by the Viet Cong, along with several of her companions. The quality of the food could be improved. The Marines are making an incredible birthday cake. It's one of their traditions. But this time, they want every Marine in Vietnam to have a piece. An enormous job. It takes a lot of flour. And a lot of choppers. The American command launched a program to provide hot meals. Even for forward posts or inaccessible peaks like Hill 425, here on Marble Mountain above Da Nang.
right. So where is that? At the foot of Monkey Mountain, below Cloud Pass with its television transmitters, the army built a giant factory to process fresh milk and make ice cream. Efforts were also made to supply isolated posts, like this one near Fu Tuk with fresh meat. The Vietnam War was cruel not only to men. One and a half million farm animals fell victim to bombing and the GI's appetite for steak. But the majority of men in the front line continue to eat whatever was at hand, starting with the dreaded sea rations, beans and frankfurters, usually known by the more colourful name of beans and dicks. Everyone tried hopelessly to fight the boredom. The enemy had been destroyed, wiped out, burnt captured so many times, but he was still there, everywhere. The death of Ho Chi Minh changed nothing, but it was a major event and prompted the Americans to assemble captured enemy films to create this obituary of their worst enemy. It should also be said that during the 1940s, Ho Chi Minh had worked closely with the agents of the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, in the common struggle against the Japanese. He was born in 1890. With a French education and cultural background, he soon left colonial Indochina to take part in the creation of the French Communist Party in 1920. He later set up the Viet Minh, imposing his Stalinist methods in order to achieve his great dream, independence and the establishment of a communist state throughout Indochina. He would never know how the story turned out. He died on September the 2nd, 1969. Some Americans may have celebrated, but most of them didn't expect any changes. This was a war with a communist world, and Ho Chi Minh had arranged a succession by other men equally, if not more, determined. But without the aura of the father of the country, Uncle Ho. General Creighton Abrams, who succeeded Westmoreland as commander of the American forces in Vietnam, convinced Nixon of the need to attack Cambodia.
He believed it essential to destroy the rear bases of the Viet Cong to prepare for Vietnamization. Perhaps this show of force would finally prompt the enemy to accept Nixon's offer of peace with honor. In a single year, B-52s dropped 100,000 tons of bombs on Cambodia without much result. As in Vietnam, everything was underground. The decision was taken to launch a very risky ground mission, which would lead to the collapse of Sihanouk's neutral regime and the genocide of the Khmer Rouge. This fatal incursion into Cambodia shocked the whole world and turned the heart of America inside out. At the beginning of May 1970, thousands of students protested on campuses across America. On the 4th of May at Kent State University, Ohio, they were fired on by the National Guard, leaving four dead, 14 wounded. The next day, one and a half million students went on strike. A hundred thousand people demonstrated in Washington. For Congress, it was a matter of saving the country. On the 24th of June, the Senate repealed the famous Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which had, to a large extent, started and legitimated the war. Nixon was still able to cover up operations in his capacity as Commander-in-Chief of the Army. But he had to find a solution, and fast. In the process, the morale of the American Army collapsed. Fragging, Vietnam slang for getting rid of an officer who put his troops at risk, became more and more common. One grenade would make sure he never did it again. Military authorities would identify a thousand such attempts, of which about a hundred were fatal. Better prison than Cambodia. That was the slogan of hundreds of men who mutinied or deserted. Back in the States, thousands of veterans continue to demonstrate. Above all, there was the escape into drugs. These last years of the war in Vietnam marked one of the major turning points in the international consumption of drugs. The army filmed that too. Here in Saigon, drugs were sold almost openly. Syringes were available in the markets. The numerous dealers didn't even bother to conceal themselves as they offered a particularly pure white powder, 90% as opposed to 2% in the US. Vietnamese civilians employed by the Americans 
brought it in by the bagful. Everyone looked the other way. At first, the American command ignored it because marijuana kept the men quiet. But with heroin, they went mad. In combat, they could become a real danger to others. It was difficult to fight this menace, which soon invaded America. Traffic was covert and organized from the highest level. South Vietnamese government ministers and generals grew enormously rich. According to Pentagon reports, more than a third of those serving in Vietnam tried heroin. At least 100,000 men remained drug addicts. They contaminated the United States with their habit and their supply networks. In this, the Vietnam War played a terrible role. It destroyed a generation, the generation of Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, sex, <laughs> drugs, and rock and roll. For the rest of the world, it was the image of America which was spoilt. This image might be reassuring or irritating, but it was there, a powerful point of reference for everyone. At the end of 1970, after six years of war, the waste is total, especially for these. Another lost generation. In January 1971, they received the order to return home. They can't believe their eyes. What's happening? Everyone is going home. The army is packing up. Just enough time to buy a few souvenirs. Like these Russian grenades from village children. Before abandoning them to the Viet Cong. In the summer of 1969, by the time Nixon had established the process of Vietnamization, the American forces had reached 543,000 men. At the end of 1970, they were reduced to no more than 234,000 men. 156,000 in 71, and only 24,200 in 1972. It's the last retreat. The Americans left behind a mountain of equipment, a million rifles, 46,000 vehicles of all types, tanks, armored cars, trucks, and more than a thousand planes and helicopters.
Would this arsenal be enough to enable the South Vietnamese to resist? For nearly five years, General Nguyen Van Tu had been in power, something of a record for stability amid all the coup d'etat and plots. But strong support from American air power was needed in spring 72 to counter the North Vietnamese Easter offensive. It was launched prematurely by General Jap, who was dismissed after his failure. This American assistance would be the last. Nixon was under tremendous pressure to end the war. In the United States, the elections of 1972 were approaching and public opinion had had enough of Vietnam. The detente with Peking and Moscow had already begun. After four years of talks, Nixon ordered his negotiator in Paris, Henry Kissinger, to conclude an agreement with his North Vietnamese counterpart. Le Duc Tho finally agreed after a last air raid by B-52s on Hanoi at Christmas 1972. The Paris Peace Accords were signed on January the 27th, 1973. A few days later, the first American plane landed at the Hanoi airport, Gia Lam, an incredible moment. The first group of American pilots was about to be freed. And among them was a woman. Her name is Monica Schwinn, one of the German nurses who had played on the beach at Da Nang. She had been captured by the Viet Cong with three companions who died in captivity. After a long nightmare, she was free. is well known. Two years later, North Vietnam violated the peace accords and invaded the South. Nixon's promise of air support was not honored by his successors. On April the 30th, 1975, North Vietnamese tanks entered Saigon. There was a desperate attempt to escape. People crammed into anything that could fly and headed for the US aircraft carriers, cruising out at sea. There wasn't enough room for all the helicopters. Something had to give. These pictures of incredible waste will remain a symbol of the United States' first defeat. Some ran out of fuel.
750,000 people managed to escape from Vietnam, as well as from Laos and Cambodia. Some at the last minute, like Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Ki, former president of South Vietnam, later the owner of a liquor store in Los Angeles. Many of the lucky ones were transferred to camps in California before establishing themselves around the world, mostly in the United States and France. Some of the South Vietnamese soldiers got through the net, but the majority of their comrades stayed behind to face the prospect of the gulag or clearing minefields. And what of all the others, the ordinary people of Vietnam, who had simply struggled to survive 25 years of war? What would become of them? What would happen to the little nun on the road to Da Nang? What would happen to the Montagnards? The answer would come a few years later with the boat people. 57,000 Americans died 150,000 were seriously wounded. Two million Vietnamese died. Five million were wounded. This is a story which now belongs to the history books. These images are outstanding because the Vietnam War was the last conflict to be recorded by cameramen on film. These pictures are not only a chronicle of the war, they are a homage to the cinema and will become part of the history of cinema. That is why this series is dedicated to all the cameramen who lived through the horror of Vietnam with the courage of a soldier and the eye of a witness for the sake of the future.